Hey, good morning. Welcome to Southridge. We're so happy to have you with us um, on this beautiful uh, Sunday morning. Um, you know, we're... Let's stand and sing. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word Just to rest upon his promise Just to know the saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him in Jesus just from sin and self to cease just from Jesus simply taking a life and rest and joy and peace oh yeah Jesus Jesus how I Christianity, and Pastor Nathan's going to be uh, speaking on, um, you know, it's kind of, uh, I guess the cliche is there's always a silver lining, that we can see how God's working, and you know, the truth is that there's times when we can't see when God's working. Faith is just knowing that God is working, that He is in control, even when we can't see it. Uh, I was reading through the Bible, and um, in Luke chapter 4, um, you know, Jesus actually reads Prophet Isaiah's text from 700 years before when Prophet Isaiah actually told of the coming of the Messiah. 
Now, those people that believed and had strong faith, they never got to see that there was actually a Messiah that was sent to save them. And 700 years later, Christ was there speaking the words of truth. And you know, so many times we want to have that, like, feeling of, um, you know, feel-good faith. Like, it's all going to be okay, and, and it is, but sometimes we don't get to see. That's where our faith comes in, and we're just going to focus today on Christ. Because he'll never fail us. Let's keep seeing him.
that more time. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Nathan's gonna be speaking from those verses here in just a minute, but we just sang, God be my vision, right? So much of our faith and our walk with the Lord is about trusting in what we don't see. And that's what that song is about, asking God to give us vision for what he's doing, even when we can't see it. I'm going to read that first verse again, and we're just going to pray as we reflect on that truth. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Father God, I just thank you for who you are, Lord. I thank you that you are a God who oftentimes works behind the scenes in ways that we can't understand or fathom. And Lord, sometimes that's hard. But Lord, I'm just so grateful that you meet us where we're at. You meet us in our brokenness and our inability to understand. Lord, you love us uh, even in the places when we doubt and when we question. Lord, you love us. You draw near to us. And Lord, sometimes you enable us to just catch a glimpse of what you're doing. Lord, I just thank you for that. I just ask that you just be with us, just give us your vision for how you are at work in our world. Lord, we love you and we thank you for who you are and what you've done for us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. You will be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. Thank you to Paul and our team for leading us in worship this morning. Happy Sunday. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Olivia Ciata. I'm the Discipleship and Extend Ministries Coordinator here at Southridge. And I'm so glad that you chose to make Southridge a part of your Sunday this week. If you're joining us for the first time, we would love to connect with you. If you're watching online, hello to all my online viewers. Uh, you can click that near here button if you're watching online to connect us with you. If you're here in the auditorium, make sure you head back to the Welcome Center following the service. I'll be back there. I'd love to connect with you personally and to learn your name. Just a few reminders and some things to highlight for you this morning. First up is a reminder about our child dedication celebration that's coming up October 3rd. That's a great event that we have here at Southridge to celebrate our families and our children. If you would like to find more information about that or want to take part in dedicating your child, the deadline for that is actually next Sunday, August 22nd. So if you're excited to take part in that celebration but haven't yet talked to our family ministries team about about that. You need to make sure you do that this week. The deadline is next Sunday, the 22nd. And you can do that by heading online on our website. We have a family tab and the child dedication page can be found under there. Next, I want to highlight getting started, which is our newcomers gathering. I just welcomed those of you who are new, whether you are joining us today for the first time or you have been coming for the last couple of weeks and are looking to get connected. Getting started is a great next step for you. That is our one hour big picture newcomers gathering. It gives you an opportunity to meet other people who are also new, as well as ask questions and give feedback about your experience at Southridge so far. It also gives you an opportunity to uh, 
hear about some of the life groups and campus groups that we have launching in the fall, or if you're looking to get involved with serving, maybe as a greeter or with our children's ministry, uh, we would love to give you more information about that. So getting started is kind of your one-stop shop for getting connected here at Southridge. So we'd invite you to come out to that. That's happening next Sunday, August 22nd, during the 9 o'clock service. So make sure if you haven't already that you register, you can do that through the Church Center app or online. Also wanted to highlight our Jersey City Free Farm Market opportunity. This is something we've been mentioning throughout the summer. It's an awesome service opportunity where we uh, are able to serve some fresh produce to our friends in Jersey City that don't always have access to that. There are still spots available for Saturdays uh, in August, September, and October. Even though the summer is kind of coming to an end, that opportunity does continue into the fall. So if you haven't had an opportunity to take advantage of volunteering for a Saturday, we would encourage you to do that, you can find that sign up through the app or online. I'm happy to connect you with it back at the Welcome Center if you're having trouble finding it. Um, great opportunity to serve those around us. And connected to that, we also want to mention an opportunity to serve at Grow Row. Grow Row, the produce that they grow, actually goes to literally feed the Jersey City Free Farm Market. And we are going to be taking part in one of their community picks that they do. A community pick is just like it sounds. It's when they invite the community to come out and help them with their harvest. So Grow Row is an organization that donates a large portion of what they grow to local food banks and things like the farm market, and they rely heavily on volunteers to make that happen. So. Southridge, we are going to be partnering with our community to go out on August 26th, so just a couple of weeks. It's on a Thursday night, 5 to 7. We invite families to come out, groups to come out. This is definitely an all-ages event. It's a great opportunity to get your hands dirty, to help serve in our community. So especially if you're not able to, if Saturdays are a hard day for you to serve, this might be a great way for you to um, serve our neighbors in Jersey City by coming out and helping us pick produce. So there is a registration for that just so that you're able to get updates about weather cancellations and things like that. So I'm happy to point you in the direction of that back at the Welcome Center. You can also find more information about that on the app. So we would encourage you to take advantage of that opportunity. I'm going to now turn it over to Pastor Nathan. Pastor Nathan, how are you today? Good morning, everybody, and morning, Liv. Um, Liv is eagerly awaiting the joke. If you're new to Southridge, we got this weird thing. So, Liv, uh, today's joke has international flair. Uh, it's, it's safe. Don't worry about it. It's not going to offend anybody. I did make sure I asked him that. Um, Is this going to be okay to say? Yeah. It's highly sophisticated. Um, you need to be multilingual. Uh, I'm, I myself am very sophisticated and multilingual. I know, like, uh, gracias and de nada in Spanish. I know net and mm. spasiba in Russian. I'm, like, very multilingual, so... Liv, this is a very cultured, uh, highly educated, highly sophisticated joke, an international flair. Great. You ready? I'm ready. So, what do the people in Paris do with their grass clippings? I don't know. They bag it. Oh. Oh. <laughs> that was not sophisticated at all. <laughs> Come on. That was... It was wonderful. That was rough. <laughs> oh, well. Maybe another week. Maybe next time. <laughs> Come on. You got to give me some credit on that. Uh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, thank you. Um, hey, it is great to see everybody. My name is Nathan Tuck, the lead pastor at Southridge. Thank you so much for joining us online as well. And thank you for all of you who are joining us here in our auditorium also. Uh, just a couple minutes, we'll uh, pray before our teaching time. Uh, before we do that, just want to make a, a note that, you know, certainly we are aware of all the conversation and increased news related to the escalation of COVID, and uh, we certainly keep an our ear tuned to that, and uh, hopefully, like, we pray that we are able to simply continue as we are. Uh, but it is something we're truly aware of, and I'm sure all of us are, have, are concerned about that. Uh, also, we'll pray uh, also just for a lot of the hard events in our world. Uh, earthquake in Haiti, where several hundred lives have been lost. 
just the violence in Afghanistan uh, that breaks our hearts. And so I want to take a moment and pray for that. Also, Vanessa Thatcher, who was part of our Southridge congregation, passed away uh, this weekend. Uh, she was dealing with a long-term illness and uh, certainly want to pray for her family as they walk through sadness and grief and loss. Uh, also thankful that we can have confidence that she is with her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we're deeply thankful for that. Uh, thank you as well for your financial contributions to Southridge. They really do enable us to embrace God's grace and extend God's love. Uh, we want to root ourselves deeply in God's truth. And then even as you heard in some of the opportunities, uh, we want to extend God's love to places like Jersey City and other places that have, are dealing with hunger. And so uh, that is our mission and our passion here at Southridge. And so thank you for your financial giving that enables that to happen. Uh, there are offering boxes on the uh, walls as you leave, both on the floor as well as on the balcony. Certainly give online as well. And uh, thank you for that. Let's take a moment and pray, and then we'll look into God's Word. God, thank you for the season that we had to, to sing and to orient our minds, our hearts, emotions to you. I thank you that you are the God of heaven and earth, that no matter what happens, whatever tragic things happen, Lord, you still rule and reign. We do pray for the really hard things going on in our world, for the violence and conflict in Afghanistan and the just severe suffering of people perpetrated by evil and darkness and violence. For those in Haiti dealing with the natural disaster of an earthquake, who have lost lives and loved ones and homes and possessions. Lord, the mystery of these things is too large for us to understand. Uh, we know that you are good, and yet we also see such difficult things in our world. We pray for followers of Jesus that are interspersed everywhere in our world. We pray that they would be your hands and feet to bring love and mercy and compassion into these areas. Lord, we also pray for the family of Vanessa Thatcher. Uh, we pray that your hand of comfort and peace would be with them as they go through a season of loss. We thank you for the time that we have to look into your word. I pray that your truth would guide us that your Holy Spirit would help us to see things that we otherwise would not see, that you, the truth of your word would not just penetrate our brains and our minds and our cerebral part of who we are, but penetrate our, our beings, our lives, our souls, and our spirits. And we ask that in your name. Amen. This week, I read an article by Timothy Dalrymple. Uh, he recalled first tuning into the Olympics all the way back in 1984, uh, which is when they were in Los Angeles. He remembers being with his family in the family room uh, all together as they watched the TV and watched the Olympics of 1984 in L.A. unfold. Uh, that included some extraordinary athletes making extraordinary accomplishments. Uh, Carl Lewis, Edmund Moses, Mary Lou Retton, to name just a few. Uh, Timothy remembers being just infused with inspiration at seeing the gymnasts perform and compete. It actually changed his life and put it on a trajectory toward pursuing gymnastics he said it kind of felt almost like an effortless bird catching the currents of wind. That's how he felt about gymnastics. It was something that he was designed to do that resonated deeply within his heart and his soul and spirit, something that just totally captivated him. It brought him through countless, countless hours 
of practices and rehearsals brought him through injuries and excruciating pain and challenging discipline. It brought him through all of that and sustained him in it. He became a junior national all-around champion and member of the national team. It even took him to a college he couldn't have otherwise afforded to attend and an NCAA championship in his freshman year at Stanford University. He was progressing, he was moving forward. He competed around the country, he competed across the ocean, competed nationally and internationally, won many kinds of awards. And then a few months before the Olympic trials in 1996, he was on the horizontal bar and he fell and he broke his neck. In a blink, he says, my gymnastic career ended in failure and a lifelong sentence of spinal damage and chronic pain. Just a few months out from the Olympic trials of 1996, he falls from the bars and his future, his dream is forever changed. And instead of pursuing what he thought was gonna be possible uh, medals in the Olympics, he was sentenced to spinal damage and chronic pain. Certainly he's continued on with living life, but he often reflects back, why did that happen? How does that fit in to who God is? Maybe we can phrase it this way, is there a silver lining in that? That's the cliche that we're going to be looking at this morning. It's not necessarily just for followers of Jesus, although so periodically we use that. But it's a cliche that kind of resonates across our culture. But sometimes, particularly among those who are followers of Jesus, there's always a silver lining. There's always a positive side. And so this morning, we're going to be wrestling through that as, as followers of Jesus. And if you're not a follower of Christ, I hope you find this grounding and you get a sense of, of who followers of Jesus truly are. Often we define faith as being sort of this whimsical desire for whatever to happen, this whimsical, optimistic perspective. Instead, faith is having trust and confidence that the Lord is at work whether or not we can see how he is at work. Let me say that again. Faith is having trust and confidence that the Lord is at work whether or not we can see how he is at work. Probably the most famous passage in the Bible dealing with faith is in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Uh, here's what it says. You can turn there if you want, but we're just going to mostly zero in on this one verse and sort of dive in, into it. It says this, now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance or conviction, some translations say, about what we do not see. If you want to write in your Bible, I would encourage you to do that. You might want to underline what twice that happens in those verses. Now, faith is a confidence in what we hope for and assurance or conviction about what we do not see. We're going to look at three things this morning. First, we're going to look at the, the what of faith, the what of faith. Notice that verse doesn't simply say that faith is assurance or confidence or hopefulness. There's a what component of faith. There's something that faith grabs onto, and the writer of Hebrews mentioned that in terms of the what. The what is the object of faith. Faith is not just an optimistic feeling. Faith is not just sort of whimsical desires. There's a what component to faith. There's something that faith grabs a hold of and reaches out on. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, and I'll mention this later in our time as well, Paul says this, being confident of this. Paul says there's a this that we're confident in. If there's a what, there's content, there's something of substance. Faith reaches out, it grabs hold of something, a what, a this. Paul says, being confident of this, and what's the this? That he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Now, before we go in any further, we just want to talk a little bit about the word hope that the writer of Hebrews uses in verse 1. 
he mentions, now faith is, is the confidence in what we hope for. When we think of hope, sometimes we think of simple wishful thinking. We hope for lots of things. Maybe we can kind of like explain it like this. I might hope that it's sunny tomorrow. You know, I hope that it's a sunny day. I hope it's not cloudy. I hope that it's not rainy. We can hope that it's sunny. That's one kind of hope. It's, it's wishful thinking. It's what we desire. But that's not really how, what the Bible means when it speaks of hope. Instead, what Scripture means when it speaks of hope is not wishful thinking. It's confidence and assurance. I can use it this way. Whether or not... It's sunny tomorrow. One thing I know, one thing I have confidence and assurance in, there will be a sunrise and a sunset. Now, I may hope that I get to see it tomorrow, that it's not cloudy, that the sun is shining, but one thing I know, one thing I have confident assurance in is there will be a sunrise and a sunset. I may or may not see it. It may be cloudy and it may not be seen. I hope that I can see it, but I'm assured that the sun will rise and the sun will set. The second kind of assurance is how the Bible uses the word hope. Not just wishful, optimistic, hope-so thinking, but confident assurance. And the truth about faith is that it's targeted, there's confident assurance on something outside, something that's objective. Uh, some of you might watch periodically. The Colson Center has what would you say videos. They're usually four, five, six minutes long. And usually they take a topic and ask a question or a topic, and they say, what would you say? And then the video kind of explains a perspective. Uh, this a couple of themes they've done in the past was the resurrection of Jesus faked. What would you say? Is religious freedom an excuse for discrimination? What would you say? Save the planet, don't have kids. What would you say to that? So they take controversial topics and say, what would you say? And then kind of lead you through that in a thoughtful kind of way that reflects biblical truth. This week they had one that simply said, definitions matter. What is truth? What would you say? And the person who hosted it for the four or five minute video was the guy named uh, Jay Warner Wallace. I've mentioned him periodically before here at Southridge. Uh, he was a member of the Torrance Police Department, which is a sort of part of the larger metropolitan area of, of Los Angeles, California. He's been part of their SWAT, gang detail, robbery, homicide, and he was also one of the founding members of the Torrance Police Department's cold case homicide unit. Uh, and uh, as a homicide detective, he often investigated crime cases that have grown cold over a number of years. Uh, he's periodically been on Dateline NBC as they explore some of the mysteries of crime, and he's been on those shows as one of literally the premier uh, investigator in cold case murders in the U.S. Uh, he was an atheist until age 35, didn't believe that there was a God, actually came to trust Jesus as his Savior at the age of 35, and since then has used his investigative skills, particularly in investigating crimes that have been done in the past, he's used those same skills to analyze who Jesus is, his death, his resurrection. He's written books such as Person of Interest, Cold Case Christianity, God's Crime Scene, and Forensic Faith. Here's what he said. He said, if, if I say chocolate chip cookies are the best kind of dessert, he said that's an example of a subjective kind of truth. Why is it? Because I'm making a statement that's based on my perspective of how I see something. Chocolate chip cookies are the best kind of truth. They may or may not be, but I'm saying they are. That's a subjective truth. Uh, he kind of led on further, and he said, maybe this is a way to help it. He said, suppose that there are two people going out to gather mushrooms, and, and there's, there's two kinds of mushrooms. There's more, but just simplify it. There's, there's death cap mushrooms, and there's Asian patty straw mushrooms. Uh, death cap mushrooms, as, you, as the name kind of implies and in, infers, is the mushrooms are poisonous. Actually, just eating one mushroom 
can toxify your liver and kidneys to such an extent that one mushroom literally has the potential to take your life. Asian patty straw mushrooms, on the other hand, are safe and edible, nutritious, and good for you. He said, no matter what your perspective is, just because you might think this mushroom is safe, if it's a death cap mushroom, it's not going to be safe. It has the potential to be lethal. You see, the truth exists not in what you think about the mushroom, but what it actually is. If it's a death cap mushroom and you mistakenly identify it as an Asian patty straw mushroom, just because you're thinking it's Asian patty straw mushroom doesn't make it safe. Because the truth of what the mushroom is exists in the mushroom itself. It's objective truth. And so if it's a death cat mushroom, it's going to be lethal. Lethal. See, there's an objective side to faith. There's a what component. There's a this component. There's a content component. Here's the deal, friends. One thing that we know for sure, the objective truth is God is always at work. God is always at work. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. That's what scripture says. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. That's the what. That's objective. That's true. One thing we know for sure, God is always at work. But here's the problem that I have with Romans 8.28. If I could edit Romans 8.28, you know what I would do? I would change the third word of that verse. Here's the way it reads. And we know. You know what I I would love for it to say? I would love it if it said, and we see. Like, wouldn't that be awesome? Like, if I could change Romans 8.28, I would say, let's get rid of the now. And instead, I would say, how about if we all say, and we see. We see that all things work, but you know what? It doesn't say that. So, so here's the deal. One thing we know for sure, God is always at work, but we cannot always see how God is at work. We can know that he is at work. That's what Romans 8.28 says. But Romans 8.28 doesn't say, and we see how God is at work. Sometimes we can see it, but oftentimes we can't. But we know that he is at work. So how does that relate to our cliche? There's always a silver lining. Number one, if God in his grace and mercy allows you to see a silver lining, humbly thank the Lord for what you can see and be grateful to him. If there's hardship, if there's tragedy, if there's difficult circumstances, and God allows you to have a snapshot, just a small perspective, if he does allow you to see, be grateful for that. Humbly give thanks to him. It's actually what Paul did, believe it or not. And in Philippians chapter 1, Paul's, we mentioned last week, he's writing this in prison. Here's what Paul says, and, and, and he sees a little bit of a silver lining. He says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. So Paul says, there's a silver lining in my imprisonment. You know what it is? Like the people that I'm chained up to, they're my captive audience, Like, I'm able to share with them the message of the gospel. Furthermore, he says, and because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to to proclaim the gospel without fear. He says, another silver lining. Not only are the people who I'm chained up to now hearing the gospel, but also people are hearing of my story and they're becoming more courageous in how they're following after Jesus. If God enables you to see a silver lining, humbly thank him for it. Humbly 
receive that as being a gift from him. But here's what I also want us to understand. Don't use the silver lining to resolve mystery. Don't use the silver lining to make things more rational or avoid pain. You see, sometimes we strain to see a silver lining so that we can make life seem more rational. We strain to see the silver lining so that we can avoid mystery. I can tell you this. Paul probably often, often wondered, why, like, wouldn't I better serve God, like, outside of jail? He didn't use the silver lining to somehow minimize the mystery of what he couldn't understand. And often we're prone to do that. If I can find a silver lining then suddenly life becomes rational. And if it's rational, then I can be in control of it. If God enables you to see a silver lining, humbly receive that from him. But don't strain so hard to find a silver lining that you minimize the mystery of what you can't see. You see, not being able to see makes us feel vulnerable. It makes us feel out of control. It makes the future seem unpredictable. It, what really strikes me is in John chapter 11, when Jesus is visiting with his friend Lazarus, well, he's actually going to Lazarus' tomb. Lazarus is dead. Jesus knows that Lazarus' death is actually going to be an opportunity for Jesus to raise him to life. There's going to be a silver lining in it. But you know what John 11 also says? Says Jesus wept. That Jesus wasn't like, oh, it's got a silver lining. No need to worry. It's got a silver lining. It's all good. Like, no. Even though Lazarus' death was going to bring about a silver lining for Jesus to raise him from the dead, Scripture still says Jesus wept. Jesus wept. So if God gives you insight into a silver lining, Humbly receive that. Be humbly grateful for it. But never use the silver lining cliche in order to somehow rationalize things, in order to avoid mystery, in order to realize that you can't always see, that there is pain, that there is hardship. Sometimes we actually use silver linings to, to minimize our need for faith in hopes of living rationally. That's the what of faith. The what of faith is there's an object to it. It's God. Secondly, there's the activity of faith. The activity of faith. Again, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is, you might want to circle this word, confidence. There's the activity in what, what, remember, that's the object of what we hope for, and assurance. Again, there's the activity about what, again, there's the object we do not see. So yes, faith has an object. It, it reaches outside of itself, but there's also activity that needs to be directed toward that object. There needs to be confidence. There needs to be assurance. There needs to be trust. There needs to be certainty that what the faith is placed in is true. We're called to go outside of ourselves. We have assurance. We have confidence in the object. You know, as we all saw a couple of weeks ago, Simone Biles opted out of competing for the, in the Olympics gymnastics. And uh, a writer from the Washington Post was talking about that and providing some insight on some of the mental challenges that can go into the mind of a gymnast. And he used a word that at first seems maybe frivolous and lighthearted to us, but apparently it's lingo within the gy gymnastics community that's actually used uh, pretty substantively in terms, of it, in terms of what it is. It's the term twisties. He said this, when gymnasts have the twisties, and again, this isn't a, a frivolous word, this is like substantive meaning within a gymnastic community. When gymnasts have the twisties, they lose control of their bodies as they spin through the air. Sometimes they twist when they hadn't planned to. Other times they stop midway through, as Biles did. And after experiencing the twisties once, it's very difficult to forget. 
instinct gets replaced by thought. Thought quickly leads to worry. Worry is difficult to escape. So when a gymnast has the twisties, midway through a jump, they don't know whether they're upside down or right side up. They don't know whether they're a quarter of the way through the move or three quarters of the way. They lose all sense of where they're at, and what was once automatic that was just muscle memory suddenly becomes conscience, and they're not sure what in the world is going on, which is exactly why it's so dangerous. You know, friends, the reality is that sometimes in a walk with God, we have the spiritual twisties. We don't know what's up. We don't know what's down. We don't know where we are. We don't know what's happening around us. Steve Brown is an older preacher now, and I used to listen to him periodically. I just remember this one thing he used to say. He used to say, he said, people would come up to me and say, what's God doing in your life? And he said, what I would often say is, I have no clue. Like, I have no clue. He says, ask me maybe three years from now, hey, what, God, what was God doing in your life back then? Maybe I'd be able to respond. But he said, most of the time, I don't have a clue what God is doing in my life. I just know that I'm called to trust and obey. I, I know that he's solid. I know that his promises are true. I know that I'm called to have the activity of placing my confidence and assurance in him, no matter what I see, no matter what I experience. That's all I know. Ask me what God is doing in my life. I don't have a clue. I don't have any idea that's what he said. You see, friends, ultimately we trust in God and not ourselves. Sometimes there's a silver lining and we become humbly thankful and humbly gracious for God's gift to us to be able to see the silver lining. Other times we don't have a clue. There's nothing to see. We don't know whether we're upside down or right side up, a quarter of the way around or three quarters of the way around. All we can do is say, God, I'm going to have the activity of humbly and confidently trusting in who you are. Just a couple thoughts. So trust when you can't see. Listen to this. Faith is not believing in God. Faith is believing God. Trust when you can't see. Trust when you're upside down. Trust when you have the twisties. Trust when you're disoriented. Faith is not simply believing in God. Most people do. I think it's 90% of Americans believe in some kind of God. Everybody believes in God. The question is, do you actually believe him? Do you believe God? Not just in God, do you believe God? Do you trust him? Do you have assurance in his word? Are you confident in what he's saying? Secondly, trust when you can't, not only trust when you can't see, also be cautious about pointing out silver linings for someone else's pain. You see, kind of one of our challenges sometimes as followers of Jesus is because we actually do believe that God is working things for the good. Sometimes we try to be of help and point out to other people who are going through painful things where the silver lining is in their lives. Be very cautious about pasting silver linings on other people's lives. I literally got a text between services from someone in our congregation who's just going through a lot of difficult stuff. And they said, yeah, like, thanks so much. Be careful about pasting your perceived silver linings on somebody else's life. It's something we need to be humble about. It's something we need to be incredibly grateful that God is at work. Remember back again to Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Listen, friends. God is going to carry out his work in your life. Be confident of that. Be confident of God's promise that he will fulfill his good purpose in your life. Sometimes you'll be able to see it. Sometimes you'll be upside down. Thank him for the gifts of being able to see silver linings. 
But lots of times, you'll have to trust him when you're completely disoriented. You'll have to trust him, not when you can see because you can't see. You'll have to simply know that he's going to be at work. And simply, let's encourage one another. Let's encourage one another to have faith. Let's not simply paste our silver linings on other people's lives in hopes of kind of avoiding the mystery. Let's be comfortable with the fact that sometimes God allows things to happen or does stuff that we don't have a clue. And so instead of encouraging you with maybe a silver lining, what instead we can do is encourage you that you can have confidence, you can be assured that God is faithful, that he's going to carry out his purpose in your life. I'm not wise enough to see what the silver lining might be, but one thing I know, you can have confidence, you can have assurance of God's work in your life. Lastly, the what of faith, the activity of faith. Lastly, the fulfillment of faith. The fulfillment of faith. You know, just jumping down a little bit, there's a verse in Hebrews 11 I'm not totally comfortable with. Kind of wish maybe that it wasn't there. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, after the writer of Hebrews talks about, you know, these different people, people like Abel, others who walked the earth, who followed after God, who trusted in him. Here's what the writer of Hebrews says. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. That's a powerful verse, isn't it? I mean, think of the one of the guys that the writer of Hebrews lists. He lists Abel. Cain and Abel were the sons of Adam and Eve. Cain was the older brother. Abel was the younger brother. Uh, Cain became, became, became angry at Abel and murdered his brother Abel. Abel was dead. There were no silver linings for him to see. I love that when it says, these people lived by faith when they died. They didn't always receive everything, but they knew that it was coming. They, they knew that the promises of God may not necessarily be seen in this lifetime, may not necessarily be able to see the silver linings. They may not necessarily be able to see the fulfillment, but they knew that fulfillment was coming. They knew that God was faithful. They knew that God would be true to his character. They knew that one day what God said would come to pass. They didn't see it in their day, but they knew God will be faithful. Our faith and trust in him will be fulfilled. He will prove to be victorious. You know, but probably three or four weeks ago, I was just sitting down here literally just before, actually during the beginning part of the service, and my phone buzzed, and I took a look at it, and it was a text message from a gentleman. He and his family were part of our congregation many years ago, probably 18 years ago, something like that. And I've generally maintained contact with them, and they were transitioned out of the area in a couple different places. Had four children, um, all grown now. And uh, a couple years ago, I was, as I was interacting with them, uh, they are probably late 50s, maybe early 60s at that time, somewhere around there. And uh, they had fostered three children. They were all siblings. They all had the same mother. Each one had a different father. Uh, some of the fathers were in prison, that kind of thing. And I remember talking with them. He said, you know, we're kind of wrestling whether or not we should adopt these three siblings. Uh, we're kind of, you know, not necessarily the age where we're ready to jump in with a, you know, what was then a two or three-year-old at that time. Um, but we're just kind of wrestling whether, you know, we should kind of inconvenience ourselves and and that's what God has for us. And so they prayed about it, and they chose to adopt all three. And uh, presently, their age is, I think, 7, 12, and 19. And so they've spent a couple years now. And uh, 
I got a text message from him. He just said, like last night, our 19-year-old was found dead in a home. Not their home. He had moved out of the house with some friends. And as it turned out, it was an accidental overdose of insulin. Uh, but there were some challenges that they walked through, and it wasn't an easy path. And about a week or two later, I gave him a call just to say, hey, I'm thinking of you and praying for you. And he said, you know, he said, when you adopt, you don't sort of bring like some child into your healthy life situation. He said, you step into their dysfunctional situation. You don't sort of rescue someone and bring them into the health of your family structure. Your whole family structure steps in to the situation that that child has. When I was talking to him on the phone on a Sunday evening, he referenced this verse in Colossians 1.24. He says, now I rejoice, this is Paul speaking, in what I am suffering for you. Listen to this. And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, which is the church. In other words, he said, well, like there's something about the suffering of Christ that certainly took care of the penalty of sin once and for all. Like nothing else can pay that. But in the plan of God, there's suffering that we're called to that somehow contributes to the ongoing work of God's redemptive activity in our world. That Jesus' death pays for sin. That's the only thing that can pay for it. It's the only thing that can pay for the evil and curse of sin. But in a very real way, is that there's still suffering to be had that somehow contributes to the ongoing work of Jesus in our world. And he said, this gentleman said, I've been thinking about that verse, that we're not called to easy, we're not called to see it all. We're actually called to, to fill up what's lacking in Christ's suffering, not that, not that what's lacking is for sin, but that for God's movement to go on, for the work of Jesus to go on, that there's suffering, there's burdens that we carry for that to go on. Now we talked for a little bit and we prayed, texted him a couple times over the last couple weeks. And one of his texts back, he was you know, just talking about some of the challenges, uh, just a kind of a complicated set of circumstances. He said, I feel like the Lord is meaning us in many different ways and is bringing his word to life in new ways, but also feel like life is slogging through deep mud. So, wow. He says, I see how, I see the beauty of God's truth. God's word is coming to light in fresh ways. But he also said, I also feel like that sometimes life is slogging through deep mud. I'm thankful that God has brought his word to even greater clarity through this experience. But he says, circumstantially, man, I feel like it's slogging through deep mud. I'm going to ask our team to come out, and we're going to sing a song that we part of the song that we sang earlier in the service that simply says that in Christ alone is our faith, our trust, and our confidence. Listen, friends, you and I can be disoriented. Sometimes God gives us the gift of seeing a silver lining. And if that's the case, be so thankful. Say, God, thank you for the gift of the silver lining. Thank you for making your word become more real. Thank you for the silver lining. But sometimes we don't see. Because Romans 8, 28 says, and we know it doesn't say, and we see. And so sometimes the fact of the matter is, we're disoriented. We don't know what's up. We don't know what's down. 
We have no clue what God is doing. But however disoriented you are, through Jesus, you'll never be disconnected. You might be disoriented, but you will not be disconnected. God's love and his grace will hold fast to your life. You'll be disoriented. You'll not be disconnected. Why is that? Listen to this. The reason is because Jesus was never disoriented. His trust was always in the Father, but Jesus was disconnected. On the cross, Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was never disoriented. His trust was always in the Father. But the reality is, he was disconnected. He was forsaken by the Father in heaven. What does that mean? It means you will be disoriented, but you'll never be disconnected. God's love will hold you fast. God's Holy Spirit will always be at work in your life. You can have confidence that the good work that he's begun in you, he will bring to com completion. You can have confidence that in all things, he's at work for the good and those who belong to him. Once in a while, you'll see some silver linings. But whether or not you see them, you can know that God is there, that he is with you, that you can trust him, even when there's not a silver lining to see. Let's stand and sing the song together to close our service.
in the power of Christ I'll stand Here in the power of Christ We'll stand Faith is having trust and confidence that the Lord is at work whether or not we can see how he's at work. Our prayer team will be down here to my right, or my left, your right. I'm going to take a moment and pray that God would increase our faith this week. God, this week, may our confidence, assurance grow in your faithfulness that you will bring to completion what you began that you will accomplish that which is good. Thank you for the gift of silver linings. Thank you for the gift of glimpses of beauty as to how you're working. But God, we also trust even when we don't see. We know that you are at work. We want to trust you when we don't see how. Strengthen us in that. Thank you that you are victorious. Thank you that through you, Jesus Christ, all promises will be fulfilled. Thank you that you are faithful. May our faith and trust be in you. We ask in that name of Jesus, our Savior, and everyone who agreed said, amen. Everybody, great to be with you. Thank you for joining us online, and God bless and have a wonderful day.